Hello students and welcome to Architex Academy Virtual Classroom. So today's lecture is going to be about timber double floor. So this can be a question in your exam and this will be mainly a drawing question. So the in the drawing question you will be asked to make a drawing for a given size of a room. You will be asked to show a timber floor. Now you will not be given uh, the details like you will not be told whether this is a single floor or a double floor you will have to decide that based on the dimensions of the room you will be expected to draw plan elevation and section and details to the mentioned scale so without further ado let us go and see details of the timber double floor hello students and welcome to another video lecture from architects academy Today we are going to learn about timber double floor. So what you are seeing here is a room which has a dimension of 4 meters in this direction. So as you can see here the distance from this point to this point is 4 meters and the length of the room from this point to this point is going to be 6 meters. So this is a room of size 4 meter by 6 meter and we are supposed to provide a floor for this room. Now as you know that the in the case of the single floors the main members which we had used were the joists. So if you look at the uh, members here which are the joists these are the joists which are which were used in the single floor. So these joists are nothing but wooden beams. So what you can see here is that there is a limitation to the amount of span for the joist. For example, you can see that here the joist is having a limited span and therefore for that particular span, the depth of the joist is so much. Maybe this is about 150 millimeters in depth. But when we go on increasing the span, what happens is that the depth also goes on increasing and hence we cannot locate these joists along this 4 meter span. Logically what we could do is that just put joists in this direction along the 4 meter span and provide a timber planks or timber floor on top. But that would make the joists very thick or that would increase the depth of the joists and as a result of that, the floor will become uneconomical. So what we have done in this particular case is that we have divided the total length. That is this total length is 6 meters. We have divided that length into three bays. This is bay 1, bay 2 and bay 3 by providing two beams which are again wooden beams but of a bigger size. So this is one beam and the second beam and these beams are called as the binders. So the function of the binders is that they divide this space into three bays, three bays of two meters each now in this case. As a result of that what happens is that the joists are now going to have a span which is only going to be two meters in width, two plus some type of overlap here. So that is why we can now use the joists at right angles to these particular binders as you can see here. So this uh, floor, this type of a floor will be called as a double floor. The reason for calling this as a double floor is because there are two main members in this timber floor. The first member is these binders which we can see here and the other members are the joists which are running at right angles to these uh, binders. On top of these joists we have the floor which is made out of the timber floor bolts. So we have got these floor bolts which are at right angles to the joists. Now what you can see here is that the load of the floor which is going to come on top of this floor is going to be transferred to the joists and the joists in turn are going to transfer the load to the binder and the binders are then going to transfer the load to the <coughs> walls. So what we see here is that the load which is carried by the binders is going to be a point load and therefore if we 
directly place the binders on the brick wall what is going to happen is that the bricks are likely to get crushed as a result of this heavy point load which is going to come so to distribute this load of uh, the binder over the brick wall we use a concrete pad or a stone pad which we can see here so this type of a uh, member we call it as a stone pad or a concrete pad so we can indicate it by some color so what you can see here is that we can possibly use some color so uh, i'll just indicate it by this blue color so this is a stone pad this is a stone pad or a concrete pad so this can be either made out of stone or this can be made out of concrete so the purpose of this particular concrete pad or stone pad is that it will distribute the load a point load from the binder over this wall and prevent the crushing of the bricks so this is the two main members which we had seen now again i will indicate those two members with a color so what you can see here, here is this particular member which is the binder this is the second binder so what we have is two binders like this and these two binders are resting on both the sides on this concrete plate or uh, uh, stone template so uh, this is how the binders are going to be placed now across the binders what you can see are the joists so i will indicate those joists by another color so what you can see here is that this is the joist so these are going to be the joists which are going to be placed at right angles to the binders and they are going to be joined to the binder and on this side to another wooden member here which we call as the wall plate so here what we'll see is that there is another timber member which we put across uh, where the joists are coming and resting on the wall and that member is called as a wall plate so i'll just indicate it by color here so what you can see here is this is the wall plate now the reason for having this wall plate is that again here the joists which are coming here these joists are actually imposing a point load on this wall <coughs> and the wall plate is now serving three purposes the first purpose is that it will distribute the load coming from the joist evenly on the wall that is it will convert this point load into a udl second thing is as you can see here that there is a notch created in the wall plate and the joist is inserted into this notch so as a result of that this will prevent the overturning of this joist so because of load the joist may have a tendency to overturn and therefore this will prevent the overturning of the joist so this is the second purpose of the wall plate the third purpose of the wall plate as you can understand here is that when we construct a wall like this this particular wall then this wall need not be perfectly at level and therefore if we directly place the joists on the wall then the tops of these joists will not come at the same level because it is very essential that all the tops of these joists should come at one level you will also realize that the joists though we are showing them as rectangles here they are not necessarily of a uniform size you can have joists which are of a slightly varying size and therefore again there could be a level difference at the top of the joist so to nullify this level difference or to adjust this level difference what we do is that the notch which we create inside the wall plate we will either uh, increase or decrease the notch so that the tops of all the joists are brought at exactly horizontal level so that the floorboards which are put on top will again become come exactly at level so this is the third reason for having the wall plate so we saw three reasons one reason is to uh, uniformly distribute the load over the wall second is to prevent the overturning of the joist and the third is to help in leveling the top of the joist so that is why the wall plate is required now let us go to the last member of this that is the floor plate uh, the floor boards 
so I will show it by a color here so we'll go here and just indicate it by a color so what you can see here is the uh, floor boards these floor boards are running at right angles to the joists and they are joined to each other by means of a special type of a joint as you can see here this is called as the tongue and groove joint so for each board on one side there is a tongue and on the other side there is a groove so there is a tongue and groove joint we'll also indicate here that the tongue there is a gap kept between the tongue and the groove to allow for expansion of the tongue uh, tongue due to uh, expansion due to moisture these floor boards are having a tng joint but as you can see here these floor boards need not necessarily be of the full length because this length is going to be quite big we saw that the total length was about 4 meters so you may not have the floor boards of 4 meter in length and therefore they also may need to be joined somewhere in the middle along the length of the floorboard so whenever they require to be joined along the length we give them what is called as a splayed joint or as you can see a joint which is slightly at an angle like this so this is called as the splayed joint and this splayed joint normally is given exactly on a joist and then it is staggered what it means is that for one floorboard this joint would come on this joist and then on the second floorboard it would come on uh, this particular joist so alternatively this will be placed so that whenever we see the uh, floorboards this joint if it is in the same line this may actually go slightly uh, wavy and it may not be it may not look good that's why these joints are normally always staggered on one joist and the other joist so this type of a joint which we give along the length of the floorboard now remember this is a joint along the length of the floorboard this is called as a splayed joint and this particular joint you will be nailing this into the floor joist so this is how these uh, floorboards are fixed now one more small detail which you need to understand about the floorboard is that when we fix the floorboard what you will see is that this particular floorboard is actually going to be fixed sideways what it means is that suppose we have this floorboard this floorboard will be kept like this and then it will be moved sideways like this and then it will be jointed like this so this is a sideways fixing of the floorboard so we can do this sideways fixing right from this end to that end but now actually what happens for the last floorboard that is the problem because here though we have not shown a wall here actually this is going to be a wall we are not shown this just for the purpose of explaining the junction between the wall plate and the joist and all that so what we see here is that the last floorboard we cannot slide it into anything and therefore we can do this up to this particular point that we can slide these floorboards from the side but for the last floorboard this cannot be done and hence this has to be fixed from the top so therefore you'll see that for the last floorboard a different type of a joint is used here so the last floorboard would be fixed not from the side but it would be fixed from the top so if you look at this particular floorboard what we will see is that this floorboard is now fixed from the top and it is not fixed from the side so this will be the floorboard how it will come on the side these floorboards will already be fixed in position and then this floorboard will be brought and it will be fixed from the top like this so this is one more small detail which you should note about the floorboards here again we'll see how this particular floorboard is actually fixed to this from the side so this is how the floorboard will get fixed from the side okay so these floorboards are going to continue right throughout and form the floor of the uh, room now one more detail which is there is this particular joist what you can see here is the joist now these joists are long pieces of timber with a smaller width 
and therefore these joists have a tendency to bend along the length lateral bending so i will try to indicate it here by a line so what we are trying to uh, show here is that this would have the joist would have a tendency to uh, you know bend laterally like this uh, sideways uh, sideways bending like this sideways or like this you can see so this is exaggerated uh, sketch which i am showing but maybe something like this it will tend to bend sideways like this so what you will see is that this sideways bending of the joist uh, could take place and therefore to prevent this lateral bending or what we call as the sideways bending of the joist we provide members in the center of the span this is now the span of the floor joist from here to here in the center of the span we provide members like this which are going to be crossing each other like this and they will be nailed to this particular joist at these points and these points so this type of a member which is placed or this pair of members which are placed in the center they are going to be called as herring bone strutting so this particular arrangement is called as strutting arrangement and this particular arrangement is called as herring bone strutting now uh, the reason for providing this herring bone strutting as i told you is to prevent the lateral bending of the joist and therefore this strutting system has to be complete that is at the very end of the wall also we must have a proper uh, fixing and therefore you will see that the last joist is now normally going to be placed at a distance of about 50 millimeters from the wall as i told you earlier these uh, though we have shown this wall as separate it is it is this wall is actually a complete wall so in actual reality this wall is like this it's a full wall coming right up to the uh, floor at the top but we have purposefully shown it like this for clarity purpose so there will be a wall here so what you will see is that the first floor joist which you can see here this first floor joist is actually placed at a distance of about 50 mm from this wall the reason for this is that there should be sufficient space around the joist for air circulation so the air should circulate around the joist this is one of the important parts of a timber floor that the air should circulate around the joist because what happens is that if this does not happen the, uh, the, the timber could get affected by a fungus which is called as a dry rot fungus so now to close this 50 millimeter gap what we do is we provide what are called as wedges so there is a pair of wedges one member like this and the other member is like this so these are going to be wedge shaped members so what is done is that one member is first fixed and the other member is hammered from the top and then this becomes a complete system so this can be tightened or loosened by by actually using this wedge wedges a pair of wedges so you can see this pair of wedges here again they have been shown separately so they are they are actually two members and these two members are separate members but they are having on one side it is a, a plane surface on the other side it is an inclined surface so when we join these two members together we when we move this one member with respect to the other member the space between this goes on increasing and therefore we can actually tighten or loosen the system by using a pair of wedges so that is why we are using wedges here here and again at the level of the uh, uh, level of the hearing bone strutting that is going to come here so at the end of the hearing bone strutting we are going to have these wedges so in plan if you look at these wedges they are going to look like uh, simple parallel lines like this so we are going to see one line which is going to be uh, this is going to be slightly smaller the other is going to be slightly bigger and, and as they go down you will see that this thing changes so the lower end here is smaller and the end here is bigger so this is how the wedges are actually placed at the end of the joist now let us look at the other joints which are there in the floor so what you can see here is that there is a notch which we create 
inside the wall plate which you had seen already that notch is called as a housing so if you look at this uh, joist and if we just uh, physically lift up this joist like this uh, above uh, what you will see is that there is no cut made inside the joist but there is only a cut made inside the wall plate and this joist is actually going to come and sit inside this member so this is the type of joint which is there this is called as a housing joint you will also see that the joist does not continue up to the end again in this case we are going to leave a gap around this joist from all sides so that there is a proper ventilation now let us look at the joint between the binder and the joist so in the same way that we did earlier let us lift up this joist and try to see how the joint has been made so now in this case this is going to be called as a cog joint and what is done here is that a small cut is made inside the binder you, you try to understand that if you make a very big cut inside the binder it will weaken that so it is just enough so that the binder will rest on this particular surface which is there and then this particular joist is cut in such a way that it will form a joint and then this will come and actually uh, be exactly in the middle of this binder so as as you can see now this will go and get fixed inside so what you will see here if we look at the x-ray view of this is that part of the joist has gone inside the binder as you can see here and the rest of the joist is outside so that is how uh, this joint is going to look like so there will be one cogged portion here and then if we lift both these joists like this then we are going to have what is called as a double cog joint so what you can see here now is a cog here and a cog here so what we are going to see is double cog joint so this double cog joint will be there all throughout and therefore if we try to see this if we turn off the joist totally what we will see is that the binders are going to have these types of cogs right throughout at exactly the same distance as the spacing between the joists the joists normally are spaced between 350 to 400 uh, center to center as per the span of the structure so uh, that is how we are going to join the joist to the binder so what we have seen now we'll just quickly summarize this is going to be a double floor the double floor consists of uh, two members which are going to divide the total span into base which will be roughly between two to three meters and these members we are going to call them as the binders then on top of the binders at right angles to the binders these are going to be the joists so these joists will be placed at roughly 350 to 400 center to center on one side of the joist we are going to have the wall plate on which these binders are uh, these joists are going to come and rest and on the other side these are going to be jointed to the binders by means of a double cock or cog joint as we call it now we also saw that on top of the joist we are going to have the floorboards the floorboards are going to be at right angle to the joist and they are going to have a tongue and groove joint which is going to be there the last floorboard which is going to be just next to the wall will have a lap joint like this and this will be fixed from the top while the rest of the floorboards will be fixed from the side as they are fixed you will also see that along the length of the floorboards there will be a lengthening joint or along the length and this will be called as a splayed joint so what we can see is that this is a sort of an angular joint which we give this is called as a splayed joint and this will not be again in the same line but it will be on alternate joists we will be having the splayed joint so as to prevent the um, uh, sort of distortion which we might see as a result of the floorboards which are going to be there now one more thing which we saw was these members these members are going to be called as the strutting 
the strutting is required to prevent the horizontal or lateral bending of the joist as a result of the long length of timber they will have a tendency to bend horizontally in this direction lateral direction and therefore in the middle of the span we are going to provide this strutting this strutting in this particular case this type of strutting is called as a herring bone strutting and as you can see from here these are two members which are going to be forming a sort of a X and they are going to be connected at the bottom and at the top of the choice they will be nailed to them now the strutting system at the end where it goes and touches the wall it will be uh, fixed by using a pair of wedges so on this side there will be a pair of wedges on the other side there will be a pair of wedges to tighten or loosen the system so I think that's about all that we had seen and I think uh, I hope that you have followed the double timber double floors if you have any queries then you can get in touch with me at architectsacademy at gmail.com thank you